you guys want to open up your Bibles if you have them. We're going to continue our study in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. We've been working our way through, if I can find it. There we go. So we, we find ourselves here, last week we're talking about salt and, and light, and this week we're going to be talking about on verses 17 through 20 here, um, talking about um, the law and the prophets and righteousness, things like that. So we're going to go through these verses, and then we'll, we'll uh, break it down a little bit. So verse 17, this is Jesus continuing as he's been speaking. He says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is a very interesting and challenging passage, especially for um, in that day, um, thinking about even the end, the scribes and the Pharisees being the epitome of righteousness, the ones that everyone looked to, the ones that had it all together. And Jesus is saying, you know, they're not even good enough. It has to be more. And now what's greater than them? And we're going to find out that that is Jesus. He's saying here in verse 17, the reason why he didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. He actually came to fulfill them. And so when we look at that, the commandments obviously are the Ten Commandments. You find them in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Those are the, the Ten Commandments written on the stone tablets. And Moses brought them down for the people. And th those are God's standards. We talked about standards and uh, we have standards in aviation. That's what we're kind of learning. We're learning the basics and all the things that are standard in how you operate things. Jesus is talking about the standards that God set forth for his people. And those are supposed to carry through for the whole world. But uh, the Jews kind of kept them to themselves, thinking that they, they were God's chosen people and everyone else was just fire for hell. That's a different conversation. But what he's talking about here, he's saying, listen, God has his standards he didn't come to take God's standards away. He came as God, from God, as his son, to fulfill those things. And when you see the, when you're, when you're talking about being fulfilling something, he's telling them that I'm going to complete them. Um, or you could also say satisfy, execute, finish, you know, verify, validate, you know, those types of things. He's really coming in and saying, I'm all about it. The Pharisees and the scribes are all about it, but Jesus is saying, if they think they're all about it, I so much more so am all about it um, to the point where he is going to fulfill it. He's going to complete it, um, not abolish or destroy it. He's not taking it away. They, they came in when they would talk to Jesus and later on in his ministry, they would come at him and say, you're blaspheming. You're going against God and his law and you're going. It's everything they understood. He was going against it because they had a misunderstanding. So a lot of times when people have a misunderstanding, they get defensive. And so Jesus is dealing with people who are very defensive um, and because they're, they don't have a misunderstanding. You know, it's natural for us to have that misunderstanding. But he's talking about the law and the prophets. Prophets are the, those men in history. They have a lot of books written about them in the Old Testament that proclaim God's word, telling either of things that were happening, going to happen, or going to happen in the distant future. Uh, or even prof being a prophesying is talking about something, proclaiming God's word. It, it doesn't have to be future, but... Jesus came to fulfill the things that were told of the Messiah, and he did that 100% um, all the way through. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about all those details in the next verse. He says, assuredly, I, verily, verily, if you have that translation, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. So he's saying, you can, you can count on this. Take this to the bank until heaven and earth pass away, which that tells me something that heaven and earth will pass away. So he's not saying, you know, maybe if it does pass away, then that might happen. He's saying, not until then, you know, until that happens, everything that's contained here is going to stay. And he even brings it down to the smallest detail. So 
jot and tittle are in interesting words that we don't use here in English that much, except I will point this out. So jot is the uh, Hebrew or Aramaic letter yod, which is the smallest letter. Um, the Greek equivalent is iota. We've actually heard that term before. We've used it. Some of us in our, in our vocabulary use not one iota, just a small minuscule piece. Like nothing's going to change, not one little bit. So that's something we use today, an extremely small amount. So that's the one thing he used for an example. And then a tittle, it actually means a little horn, and it rever it's the smallest stroke in writing. It's like the apostrophe that goes above the letter just to differentiate it. It's just this little, the little. So every little detail of all the, the law that God established, he's saying it's important and it's going to be fulfilled, all of it. Not one thing's going to be wiped away. Not one thing's going to go somewhere else. It's all going to be here. And so that's good for us to know that we need to pay attention to all of it. We don't need to focus on one thing and just stay there and be like, this is where I'm going to live. I want this. I don't really care about the rest of it. It's all God's word. It's all here. And Jesus is saying that he's going to fulfill all of it, every single bit of it. And then he goes, he switches gears here in 19. He says, whoever breaks one of the least, which they're all important, but he's saying even just a little bit of wrongness, like one thing makes you un imperfect, right? You're, you've messed up. And we call it sin because you missed the mark. If you missed the mark even one time, that seems very harsh, but that's the, that's the standard. Standard is perfection. And the only one who is ever perfect is Jesus. He's saying, you break one of those commandments and teach men so. So if you even take it so far as to tell others to do that, then you should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great. Whoever takes what he's saying, what Jesus is saying, and decides to use that in their life and to tell others about him and what he's done and point to him as the perfection, not themselves, not the self-righteousness like the scribes and the Pharisees, pointing to Jesus. It always comes back to him. He's the one that fulfilled it. And then you're going to have this greatness. It, like, it's, it's one of those things like you don't, you want to not have it, but then you have it. And so like when you're desiring after something and you can't have it, it's like the opposite. You got to, you got to come at it a different way. Kind of like he talked about in the beginning with the meekness and the, you know, the, the poor in spirit, all those things that he talked about, that is the attitude that's going to understand these commandments and the fulfilling of the law. Now, one thing as I was just contemplating this, it, it's kind of like if you think of 19, verse 19 as compromise. Compromise in the smallest area of your life is unacceptable. It's, it's not, not an option, okay? And as we were going over last week and a couple weeks here in the aviation, all the charts, all the formulas, all the calculations, all the checklists, all the details that go into aviation, you can't take shortcuts. You can't compromise. You know, when you do that, there's accidents. We saw that video of the, the accident, right? There probably could have been ways to avoid that. But you go through all the process. You learn how to do it so that in every little detail so that you have the safest flight possible. You have to go through the steps. If you don't go through the steps, if you don't stick to what has been established and confirmed is necessary and valid and in practice for years, you know, those types of things. And what Jesus is saying is like all the detail that God provided is important, so you need to, s you need to stick to it. You need to continue to learn it. You need to absorb it in, right? Just like any pilot will do as well. They can continue to learn. We talked about that a few weeks back. So no compromise, okay? And it's all necessary. Um, I, I was thinking about the, the, the designing of the aircraft. The people that made it are probably the ones you can trust to tell you about it, right? The, we looked at the instruction manual. It told you all the charts. They, they made the craft, they designed it, and then they created this information that allows you to understand it better. So God designed the whole world. He designed you and me, designed everything about it. He had a plan from the beginning. He gives us the instructions, and then we read them and understand it a little bit better and try to execute the plan the way he wants us to. We let him show us what to do. Right? We allow him to tell us through his word what's right and wrong. And then we, we just understand it and we, we accept it on in faith. right? Because really what he's talking about is the destination. You know, our, our planned course is not to land here on earth. We're going to take off and we're going we're gonna to continue on to heaven. That's where we're going. This is just temporary. So us that are passing through, we, we're, we're not looking to land here and stay here any time. We, we want our flight path to be God's flight path and to take it all the way to heaven that's that's our destination and let him chart the course verse 20 he talks about this he says unless your righteousness exceeds you know he, he makes that differentiation because they were the standard of the day unless you exceed them 
unless you go above the er highest earthly standard for righteousness, you can't enter the kingdom. It means that you're never going to make it on your own. Jesus is establishing that the law was set just to show you that you couldn't do it. It's God's standard, but it's to prove to you that you're incapable of self-righteousness, of being righteous on your own. It's impossible. No matter how hard we try, no matter how good we think we are, it is impossible um, to do it on your own. You have to rely on Jesus. He's the only one who ever fulfilled all the law and all the prophets and all these things, every little bit, completely, so that we can completely trust in him. We have to have the faith that it's his righteousness, and that's what's going to grant us access to the kingdom of heaven, not anything that we do. And actually, we'll be talking about that on Sunday in Ephesians chapter 2 anyway, but the point is, is that all the stuff we do, therefore, comes from God, come like through him. So we can just give him the glory for that. So the whole point is that everything we do is for him, and then if it's in Christ, then it's, it's of, of any, it's, it's good. If it's just of us and what we think is best and not, not asking God for any help, then it's, it's really no good. It's not going to do us any good. We call that operating in the flesh. If we're operating our craft in the flesh, we're going to go down hard. If we're operating in the spirit, we have the right stuff to keep it in the air. That's, that's really what it comes down to. So a lot of nice uh, um, tie-ins to aviation this time. I'm pretty proud of myself. So the, the Lord spoke to me this time. So I appreciate that. I'm just going to pray real quick, and then we'll, we'll hand it over, and we'll get the slides going. But Lord, again, we just pray that you would fill us with your spirit and guide us in your path and allow us to accept your free gift of uh, salvation, um, that we would do it by faith, and that the resulting things would be uh, your works that you have planned for us from the beginning. And so we're just so grateful to be a part of your family and a part of your plan. So we praise you, and we thank you, Lord, for being our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, guys. Thanks for uh, being here this evening. Um, I'll go ahead and pray, and then we will get started with the lesson. Lord, just thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word. Just pray that it would sink into our hearts and change us in a real way, and that it wouldn't just go out void, and you've promised that. So I pray for that, Lord. And I do lift up this evening and the lesson. I ask that you would... Um, use me even in my weakness and foolishness that you would help us to be clear and uh, straightforward and that our time tonight would glorify you lord in jesus name amen all right so tonight we are going to learn about start learning about weather and uh this is going to be a few weeks um it's probably going to take up the rest of our time this semester all right so um, we're going to start with a little video. Um, and well, it's a, actually a little bit of a longer video, but we're going to watch a video and then we'll talk, we'll just have some discussion questions. So we'll talk about some questions, um, after the video and depending upon how far we may end up watching two videos. So, um, you can go ahead and go. Yes. Perfect. Thanks for that. <laughs> Tutorial 11, Weather Theory. This lesson will cover weather theory. Understanding the theories behind weather helps a pilot make sound weather decisions based on the reports and forecasts obtained from a flight service station weather specialist and other aviation weather services. In any given volume of air, nitrogen accounts for 78% of the gases that comprise the atmosphere while oxygen makes up 21%. Argon, carbon dioxide, and traces of other gases make up the remaining 1%. This cubic foot also contains some water vapor, varying from zero to about 5% by volume. This small amount of water vapor is responsible for major changes in the weather. The atmosphere is made up of four distinct layers, that extend up to 350 miles from the Earth's surface. The first layer is the troposphere, which extends from the surface to 20,000 feet over the poles and 48,000 feet over the equator regions. 
Most weather happens in this region, and the temperature drops by 2 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 feet of altitude gain. The pressure also drops by an inch for every 1,000 feet of altitude gained. Above the troposphere and before the stratosphere, there is a region called the tropopause. This region traps moisture in the troposphere and the associated weather. Above the tropopause are three more atmospheric levels. The first is the stratosphere, which extends from the tropopause to a height of about 160,000 feet. Little weather exists in this layer, and the air remains stable, although certain types of clouds occasionally extend in it. Above the stratosphere are the mesosphere and thermosphere, which have little influence over weather. The atmosphere is in constant motion. Certain factors combine to set the atmosphere in motion, but a major factor is the uneven heating of the Earth's surface. Earth is warmed by energy radiating from the sun. The process causes a circular motion that results when warm air rises and is replaced by cooler air. Because the Earth has a curved surface that rotates on a tilted axis while orbiting the sun, the equatorial regions of the Earth receive a greater amount of heat from the sun than the polar regions. Solar heating causes higher temperatures in the equatorial areas, which causes the air to be less dense and rise. As the warm air flows toward the poles, it cools, becoming denser, and sinks back toward the surface. The unequal heating of the Earth's surface not only modifies air density and creates circulation patterns, it also causes changes in air pressure, or the force exerted by the weight of air molecules. Although air molecules are invisible, they still have weight and take up space. Imagine a sealed column of air that has a footprint of one square inch and is 350 miles high. It would take 14.7 pounds of effort to lift that column. This represents the air's weight. If the column is shortened, the pressure exerted at the bottom and its weight would be less. The weight of the shortened column of air at 18,000 feet is approximately 7.4 pounds, almost 50% that at sea level. The actual pressure at a given place and time differs with altitude, temperature, and density of the air. These conditions also affect aircraft performance, especially with regard to takeoff, rate of climb, and landings. The force created by the rotation of the Earth is known as the Coriolis force. This force is not perceptible to humans as they walk around because humans move slowly and travel relatively short distances compared to the size and rotation rate of the Earth. However, the Coriolis force significantly affects bodies that move over great distances, such as an air mass or body of water. The Coriolis force deflects air to the right in the northern hemisphere, causing it to follow a curved path instead of a straight line. The amount of deflection differs depending on the latitude. It is greatest at the poles and diminishes to zero at the equator. The magnitude of Coriolis force also differs with the speed of the moving body. The greater the speed, the greater the deviation. As shown above, the speed of the Earth's rotation causes the general flow to break up into three distinct cells in each hemisphere. This circulation pattern results in the prevailing westerly winds in the conterminous United States. Circulation patterns are further complicated by seasonal changes, differences between the surfaces of continents and oceans, and other factors such as frictional forces caused by the topography of the Earth's surface which modify the movement of the air in the atmosphere. Thus, the wind direction at the surface varies somewhat from the wind direction just a few thousand feet above the Earth. Atmospheric pressure is typically measured in inches of mercury, Hg, by a mercurial barometer shown on the left. The barometer measures the height of a column of mercury inside a glass tube. 
a section of the mercury is exposed to the pressure of the atmosphere, which exerts a force on the mercury. An increase in pressure forces the mercury to rise inside the tube. When the pressure drops, the mercury drains out of the tube, decreasing the height of the column. This type of barometer is typically used in a laboratory or weather observation station, is not easily transported, and difficult to read. An aneroid barometer, shown on the right, is an alternative to a mercurial barometer. It is easier to read and transport. The aneroid barometer contains a closed vessel called an aneroid cell that contracts or expands with changes in pressure. The pressure sensing part of an aircraft altimeter is essentially an aneroid barometer. It is important to note that due to the linkage mechanism of an aneroid barometer, it is not as accurate as a mercurial barometer. To provide a common reference, the International Standard Atmosphere, ISA, has been established. These standard conditions are the basis for certain flight instruments and most aircraft performance data. Standard sea level pressure is defined as 29.92 inches of mercury and a standard temperature of 59 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 degrees Celsius. Atmospheric pressure is also reported in millibars, with one inch of mercury equal to approximately 34 millibars. Standard sea level pressure is 1013.2 millibars. Typical millibar pressure readings range from 950 to 1040 millibars. Since weather stations are located around the globe, all local barometric pressure readings are converted to a sea level pressure to provide a standard for records and reports. To achieve this, each station converts its barometric pressure by adding approximately one inch of mercury for every thousand feet of elevation. For example, as shown above, a station at 5,000 feet above sea level with a reading of 24.92 inches of mercury reports a sea level pressure reading of 29.92 inches of mercury. Using common sea level pressure readings helps ensure aircraft altimeters are set correctly based on the current pressure readings. As pressure decreases, the air becomes less dense or thinner. This is the equivalent of being at a higher altitude and is referred to as density altitude, DA. As pressure decreases, DA increases and has a pronounced effect on aircraft performance. Altitude affects every aspect of flight, from aircraft performance to human performance. At higher altitudes, with a decreased atmospheric pressure, Takeoff and landing distances are increased, as are climb rates. When an aircraft takes off, lift must be developed by the flow of air around the wings. If the air is thin, more speed is required to obtain enough lift for takeoff. Therefore, the ground run is longer. An aircraft that requires 745 feet of ground run at sea level requires more than double that at a pressure altitude of 8,000 feet, as shown in the figure above. At sea level, atmospheric pressure is great enough to support normal growth activity and life. By 18,000 feet, the partial pressure of oxygen is reduced and adversely affects the normal activities and functions of the human body. The reactions of the average person become impaired at an altitude of about 10,000 feet. But for some people, impairment can occur at an altitude as low as 5,000 feet. The physiological reactions to hypoxia, or oxygen deprivation, are insidious and affect people in different ways. These symptoms range from mild disorientation to total incapacitation, depending on body tolerance and altitude. Supplemental oxygen or cabin pressurization systems help pilots fly at higher altitudes and overcome the effects of oxygen deprivation. Air flows from areas of high pressure into areas of low pressure because air always seeks out lower pressure. In the northern hemisphere, the flow of air from areas of high to low pressure is deflected to the right 
and produces a clockwise circulation around an area of high pressure. The opposite is true of low pressure areas. The air flows toward a low and is deflected to create a counterclockwise circulation. High pressure systems are generally areas of dry, stable, descending air. Good weather is typically associated with high pressure systems for this reason. Conversely, air flows into a low pressure area to replace rising air. This air tends to be unstable and usually brings increasing cloudiness and precipitation. Thus, bad weather is commonly associated with areas of low pressure. A good understanding of high and low pressure wind patterns can be of great help when planning a flight because a pilot can take advantage of beneficial tailwinds shown above. When planning a flight from west to east, favorable winds would be encountered along the northern side of a high pressure system or the southern side of a low pressure system. On the return flight, the most favorable winds would be along the southern side of the same high pressure system or the northern side of a low pressure system. While the theory of circulation and wind patterns is accurate for large-scale atmospheric circulation, it does not take into account changes to the circulation on a local scale. Local conditions, geological features, and other anomalies can change the wind direction and speed close to the Earth's surface. Different surfaces radiate heat in varying amounts. Plowed ground, rocks, sand, and barren land give off a large amount of heat. Water, trees, and other areas of vegetation tend to absorb and retain heat. The resulting uneven heating of the air creates small areas of local circulation called convective currents. Convective currents cause the bumpy, turbulent air sometimes experienced when flying at lower altitudes during warmer weather. On a low-altitude flight over varying surfaces, updrafts are likely to occur over pavement or barren places, and downdrafts often occur over water or expansive areas of vegetation, like a group of trees. Typically, these turbulent conditions can be avoided by flying at higher altitudes and even above cumulus cloud layers as shown by the image above. Convective currents are particularly noticeable in areas with a landmass directly adjacent to a large body of water, such as an ocean, large lake, or other appreciable area of water. As shown by the top images, during the day, land heats faster than water, so the air over the land becomes warmer and less dense. It rises and is replaced by cooler, denser air flowing in from over the water. This causes an onshore wind, called a sea breeze. Conversely, at night, land cools faster than water, as does the corresponding air. As shown by the bottom image, the warmer air over the water rises and is replaced by the cooler, denser air from the land, creating an offshore wind called a land breeze. Convective currents can occur anywhere there is uneven heating of the Earth's surface. As shown above, convective currents close to the ground can affect a pilot's ability to control the aircraft. For example, on final approach, the rising air from terrain devoid of vegetation sometimes produces a ballooning effect that can cause a pilot to overshoot the intended landing spot. On the other hand, an approach over a large body of water or an area of thick vegetation tends to create a sinking effect that can cause an unwary pilot to land short of the intended landing spot. Obstructions on the ground affect the flow of wind and can be an unseen danger. Ground topography and large buildings can break up the flow of the wind and create wind gusts that change rapidly in direction and speed. These obstructions range from man-made structures like hangars to large natural obstructions, such as mountains, bluffs, or canyons. It is especially important to be vigilant when flying in or out of airports that have large buildings or natural obstructions located near the runway. The intensity of the turbulence associated with ground obstructions depends on the size of the obstacle and the primary velocity of the wind. 
This can affect the takeoff and landing performance of any aircraft and can present a very serious hazard. During the landing phase of flight, an aircraft may drop in due to the turbulent air and be too low to clear obstacles during the approach. This same condition is even more noticeable when flying in mountainous regions. As shown above, while the wind flows smoothly up the windward side of the mountain and the upward currents help to carry an aircraft over the peak of the mountain, the wind on the leeward side does not act in a similar manner. As the air flows down the leeward side of the mountain, the air follows the contour of the terrain and is increasingly turbulent. This tends to push an aircraft into the side of a mountain. The stronger the wind, the greater the downward pressure and turbulence become. Before conducting a flight in or near mountainous terrain, it is helpful for a pilot unfamiliar with a mountainous area to get a check out with a mountain qualified flight instructor. Please help us spread the word about pilot training system. All right, that was a bit of a long video, so hopefully you guys hung in there, were able to retain some of these things. We're gonna, I'm gonna need some interaction tonight because I'm gonna be asking a lot of questions and I've got them up on the board, so hopefully it will be uh, less confusing. Okay. So please do answer. These aren't rhetorical questions. Uh, these are stuff that was covered in the video. So the first question is, what is the percentage of nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere? Does anybody remember? Or did, did you guys write those down? Oxygen is 21%, 21% oxygen. Close, 78, and then there's 1% of other gases, which if you do the math, you're like, yeah, of course, 79, but yeah. So 21% oxygen. Actually, let me just move this over a smidge. So no, not Teresa. All right, so we have 21% oxygen, and then 78%. and then 1% other gases. What other thing, this isn't even on the question, I'm just coming to this question in my brain, but what other, um, what other, are you going <laughs> to, yeah, thanks for answering the question that I couldn't even ask. <laughs> yes, very good. <laughs> very, very good. You, you took the words right out of my mouth. I, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm glad we're on the same page here. Okay. In what layer of the atmosphere does, weather mo does most weather occur? Remember, we have like the stratosphere, the troposphere. Troposphere. The troposphere, yes. Uh huh. <laughs> I won't even say that's cheating. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, how much does the temperature change Temperature t change per 1,000 feet in the troposphere? Does anybody remember that? It was 2 degrees Celsius for every 1,000 feet of altitude. Okay, so like, say we have a mountain, and it's 1,000 feet high down here. It's going to be two degrees warmer than it is up here at a thousand feet. Okay, so two degrees for every thousand feet increase is the temperature change in the troposphere. Now that can vary depending upon the water, the amount of water in the air, but um, that's like the standard. So, um, does the air at the equator or at the poles receive more heat from the sun? <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Does the air at the equator or at the poles? Oh. Which one? Yes, it receives more heat from the sun. Does somebody else want to say something? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, does air pressure increase or decrease with increases in altitude? 
Yes, decrease. Good job. So the air pressure is going to decrease. Um, so as you go like down here at a lower altitude, it's going to be higher air pressure. The air molecules are going to be more packed together. In other words, the, the column of air, remember how she like had that picture of the column of air on a scale? And then the column of air up here. So the pressure at a lower altitude is going to be more. Um, also, the questions get a little confusing with like increasing, decreasing. You have to kind of sort it out. That is the way they ask the questions on the knowledge test, though. So I don't want to say get used to it, but like it is, it, it does get confusing, and I feel that. But um, they do, they do do that. Ah, you already went to the next slide. <laughs> They're all just words, so I was like trying to figure out. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what force is caused by the rotation of the Earth? Does anyone remember? Starts with a C. <laughs> yep, the Coriolis force. Coriolis. Circumference. <laughs> We're just throwing out every meteorological term we know at this point. Um, huh? Oh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I should have separated these onto multiple slides, but I was like, I'm a little too lazy to do that. So, okay. Um, so the Coriolis force is the force that's what we use to that for force that um, is caused. It changes air patterns and it's caused by the rotation of the Earth. What direction does the Coriolis <coughs> deflect air and or water in the northern hemisphere? Yes. South. Kind of. It to the right is the is technically because like like it deflects it to the right and it's a little bit complicated to understand because that applies in different situations differently. We'll we'll talk about a couple of those so uh, in a minute. <coughs> okay, how many? So just remember, like, which direction does the Coriolis deflect? It's kind of a memorization point. Which direction does the Coriolis deflect air, water in the northern hemisphere? It's to the right. Um, yeah. So uh, I think there's another question that we'll I'll kind of show you a little bit what that looks like practically in another question. I think I think I think hopefully okay. Um, Uh, all right, the next question is, how many cells of air circulation patterns are in the normal hemisphere? I need to correct that. <laughs> the northern hemisphere, not the normal one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm clearly not normal. <laughs> um, okay, how many cells of air circulation patterns? And what, I, what I'm talking about here is, you guys remember the diagram of the Earth? And then she showed like these little like circulation patterns. You guys remember, just in the northern hemisphere, how many there were? Three. That's correct. Um, and that's caused by kind of two things. One of them is the fact that the the air at the equator heats up more than the air at the poles, which we know just from like it's cold at the North Pole and the South Pole, right? And it's hot at the equator and like. Brazil and, and and stuff and places that are really close to the equator. It's hot. It's cold up at the, the poles. <coughs> so the air will rise, and it causes this, like, giant circulation pattern. But then because the Earth is spinning, it causes that air to deflect to the right. Yeah, so it goes up and deflects to the right. So, and then it ends up causing, like, um, like these these cells of air that go, like rise it, it, it rises off the ground at the equator, and then it travels north, and then it starts to descend, and it's deflecting. But it starts to descend, it gets colder, and it starts to descend. The air goes down kind of to the earth, and then travels back south, kind of as wind. So you have, you end up having like wind going this direction, right there, and then there's another then there's kind of the opposite thing that's occurring. Yeah, the opposite thing is occurring here. 
and then there's a, another circular pattern there. So it causes these three like circular patterns, basically. Um, but again, and that can give us like a general idea of like overall wind patterns, but like as I said in the video, the wind is going to vary dramatically like based on local fronts and pressure systems and different things. So, but the three, kind of getting that three um, circulation patterns in your mind is good. Um, all right, does anybody remember what the two types of barometers are? Yes. Mercurial, yep, mercury and aneroid. Uh, aneroid. Well, they're both metals that melt and make an energy compound. They're both metals gallium? that melt and make energy. Gallium melts at low heat and so does mercury. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what gallium is actually. So you'll have to explain that to me after. <laughs> oh, that sounds pretty interesting and neat. Beyond my my knowledge there. Um, you have the two. The one is the mercury barometer, which uses the mercury to measure the pressure. And the other one is aneroid, which uses the different, um, it uses metal, like uh, a little metal case that expands and contracts. And that's the kind of, so when we talk about barometers, the, does anybody know, we have a barometer in the airplane. Does anyone know what, it's in one of the instruments. Do you remember what instrument it's in? <laughs> He's going back to his notes. <laughs> the pitot tube? No, not in that one. Nope. I'll wait a minute in case anybody finds it in their notes. I'll give you guys a clue. The pressure changes at lower altitudes than at higher altitudes. Remember, you have low pressure or high pressure at low altitudes, lower pressure at high altitudes. So, what would we, if we're measuring pressure, that would help us measure what? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> I'm getting crickets here. Ethan is very intently looking through his notes, though, so I don't want to just give it away. He's trying to find it. <laughs> Can I give it, Ethan? Okay. It would be the altimeter, right? Because you're measuring, I don't know why I have this marker. I'm not going to write anything on the board right now. But yeah, it would be the altimeter. So the altimeter uses a barometer to measure the amount of pressure in the air because uh, the pressure changes at a fairly steady rate um, as, you in, as you get higher up in the air. So the altimeter uses the changes of pressure, it measures the change in pressure to tell you how high you are. So it's a, it's a type. So the reason why I mentioned the two kinds of the barometers is because the mercurial barometer, the mercury barometer, is what we like base everything off of, of like, you know, two nine or nine or two inches of mercury. So like that's kind of that was the original way to measure. But they, we use an aneroid barometer in our altimeter because it's much more portable. I just gave it away. <laughs> All right. So what is the international standard atmospheric pressure, Ethan? <laughs> yes, twenty nine point nine two inches of mercury. At least you're paying attention, and, and I give you the answer, and then you don't know at the next question. So I appreciate the fact that you're paying attention. Um, okay. Uh, all right. What, how much does the pressure, gain, pressure change per 1,000 feet of altitude gain? Okay, so we've been talking about pressure change with altitude. Anybody? It's okay if you guys don't remember. So the... Pressure changes with altitude, so let's, uh, I'll just draw my mountain again. Here's 1,000 feet. Here's sea level. And the pressure is going to change one inch of mercury per 1,000 feet. Remember, pressure 
increases or decreases as you increase altitude? Decreases. So it's going to be higher pressure here, and it's going to be one inch of mercury lower pressure for each 1,000 feet. That's the standard pressure <coughs> um, lapse rate. So I would definitely, let's see, one inch hg per 1,000 feet. I would write that down. So like the two, we have two degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet. Those are two good things to memorize. Yes? Is this the equation you can get this by adding? It is. So this is another way you can write it, which is like, uh, like a little... Um, like MBG only one to the FT. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm not crazy. I was like questioning <laughs> myself there. I was like, is that okay? Is that a thing? I don't know. <laughs> uh, you guys got to keep me in line here. Okay. Um, perfect. As air pressure decreases, does density altitude increase or decrease? Yes. It does. Yep. The, and is the air thicker or thinner? Thicker. Yes. Very good. Good job. That makes me really happy, guys. Good. <laughs> All right. Does dense, high density altitude make the airplane perform better or perform worse? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, okay, yes, sorry. I just, I just didn't even see you guys' hands up. I'm sorry. I'll get you guys next time. Um, yes, worse. At, so at a high density altitude, does the airplane use a shorter or longer runway? Yes, it would need a longer runway, which isn't a good thing, right? You don't want to have to, like, have a huge runway to take off. So that's a bad thing. Um... Sure, I'm on the right here. Da, 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 da. At what altitude does the average human body begin to become impaired by hypoxia? Good job. Very nice. Very nice. I was like, did I give that answer away in the next question? But no, I didn't. <laughs> okay. What is hypoxia? Does anyone want to tell me? Yes, but specifically from something, oh, hang on. Very good. Not enough oxygen. Lack of oxygen causes hypoxia. One of the causes of not getting enough oxygen is being at a high altitude, right? So, and actually something, I just quick side note while we're on this subject. So we talked about like the percentage of oxygen per and nitrogen in the air. And then the percentage of oxygen is always like 21%, okay? That doesn't change at high altitude. It just there isn't a, as much air all over. I don't know if I touched on that when we talked about hypoxia, but since we talked about the percentage of oxygen, I just want to mention that. It's not like the percentage is like, you know, 15% at a high altitude. It's still 21%. There's just not as much air overall. So, um, okay, <coughs> perfect. Does air tend to flow toward high pressure areas or toward low pressure areas? Correct. So it goes from high to low. And I feel like I'm going to break this. So, all right, the next question, which we'll talk about this as well. What directions do high and low pressure areas circulate in the northern hemisphere? Does anybody know? Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. Okay. So actually, we'll, we'll kind of answer your question here. So you have high pressure. That's a good, it gets a little confusing. So you have a high pressure area, and then you have a low pressure area. And I'll just do them different colors because it's more fun. All right. So the high pressure area is going to have a tendency to rotate clockwise, okay? So, and then high pressure tends to flow towards low pressure, okay? So let's think about it like a high pressure is next to a low pressure. So the high pressure is going to flow this way, right? The air is going to go from high to low. And it's going to deflect to the right. So if you think about it like that, it's deflecting to the right. Does that make sense? Like it's, so it's going to look something like 
this, which, yeah, and you can see the air is going in a clockwise direction overall, okay? Then you have the air still flowing from high to low, but into the low pressure area, but it also is deflecting to the right, okay? So it's going to look something like this. Am I doing this the right way? Is that right? Is that backwards? Nope. Okay. Thank you. Give me a line. I was like, wait a minute, that's still going clockwise. It needs to go counterclockwise. So it still goes there. There we go. All right, so then you have low pressure areas which circulate in a counterclockwise direction. Okay, and that's why like hurricanes and like typhoons and those kind of things are low pressure areas and they circulate counterclockwise. If you look at a hurricane, they always spin the same way, counterclockwise. They're caused by a big, lot, really like extreme low pressure areas. Um, okay. So what direction do the high and low pressure areas circulate, circulate in the northern hemisphere? You've got counterclockwise for low pressure and then clockwise for high pressure. All right, so let's talk about, does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Um, okay, what are some characteristics of high pressure air? Anybody remember from the video? Or more lift, less airspeed for high pressure air? Yes, more lift, definitely more lift. I don't know. I don't know about less airspeed. I um, definitely more lift. So you're gonna get then in a in a weather sense. Does anybody remember what the video me mentioned? I think the video mentioned it. Of anything, did you have something you wanted to say? No. About? Yeah, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so com some characteristics of high pressure air. So let's, I guess I'll just write in here, high pressure air. With When you have high pressure air, it has a tendency to be more dry and stable and descending. When I say descending, like stable and descending are kind of similar terms. So... The air, some air has a tendency to move upward. Some air has a tendency to like stay, s stay down and stay stable. So high pressure air is stable air that has a tendency to descend or be stable. And it's usually dry. So dry, stable. And generally, you're going to see better performance on high pre in high pressure air. Now. Low pressure air would be the opposite. Can anybody guess? <laughs> <laughs> Wet and unstable. Generally, it's going to be humid. You're going to see humid, unstable air. Oh, i got to keep my color straight. Okay. Humid, unstable means the air has a tendency to rise or go upwards. You can think of it like Florida, Maine. Kind of, you know, you got hot, humid, unstable air, and then dry, more stable air up here. Now, sometimes the air can be um, humid up here because we're near the ocean, but um, for the most part. <coughs> Another term that we use, and I'll just throw this in there, for like unstable or rising air is convective activity. Now, Convection can can kind of mean just air movement in general, but usually we talk about it when it to mean like rising air, air that's moving upwards. So, um, okay, we can go to the next slide. I was trying to see if that was the last question on the slide. Okay, now let's talk about, we're going to get, now we're going to be talking about like air movement upward and downward a lot. So what types of terrain would radiate a large amount of heat and cause updrafts? Yes. Well, it's mostly volcanoes. <laughs> 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 OK. 
<laughs> it would cause a lot of amount of heat. I don't know if it causes updrafts. I mean, I mean, it does blast. Uh, what? Volcanoes cause updrafts and become alive. Go by the water. So heat does cause updrafts. So um, warmer air is going to have a tendency to rise. So you're going to see types of terrain, like when I say, you know, like grass or trees or rocks or mountains, like what kind of areas are going to create more heat? Well, you, the areas you're going to see more heat and thus, did you want to try and answer that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like areas of lar um, like rocks or sand, barren land that doesn't have a lot of green, um, plowed ground that's just kind of dirt. Those kind of areas are going to be, they're going to have a tendency to heat up from the sun. They don't heat hold their heat very well. They, they change temperature quickly. So during the day, they're going to heat up from the sun. And, and cause rising air, which actually, and I don't know if this is different here in Maine, but like they might cool down faster as well because of the change. Do you know that, Ross? I don't know. Yeah. This is my Florida aviation lesson for you guys. So when you fly in Florida, <laughs> um, feel free to correct me if I say anything that's not applicable here in Maine. <laughs> so um, in general, like during the day, so areas that have like that are kind of more barren are going to they're going to like lose their heat and they're they're going to heat up more like quickly they're going to change the heat more whereas like um like areas of vegetation are going to hold their heat better okay dun 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 and i think that yeah, what types of terrain, that's the next question, what types of terrain would absorb and retain ha heat causing downdrafts? Right. So, um, water, trees, vegetation, those, those all would kind of apply. So, um, okay, I think this is the one, this next question is the one that I'm going to, teach not the main way because <laughs> so during the day a large body of water next to land will cause a breeze in which direction can you remember yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> do you want to answer right uh uh during the day large mm, do you want do you have an answer right in from the sea to the land and again, this basically what this has to do is with is the temperature of the land versus the temperature of the water. Now, water changes temperature slowly. The land is going to have a ten tendency to change temperature quickly. Okay, so when you have, and this would, like, let's say you have, this would change depending upon where you're at, and I just, I learned that in Maine it's a little bit different because of how cold it is up here versus in Florida. So like, let's say you're on a hot summer day, a hot summer day where the sun's shining, the tank is clean, all of that jazz, and you've got the land which heats up, but it also cools down faster than the water. So the water has a tendency to stay at the same temperature. The land heats up and cools down like really quick, so it's like unstable temperature kind of. So during the day, it's going to heat up and be hot, hotter. On a hot day, on a real hot summer day, the land is going to have a tendency to like heat up, which is going to create updrafts or downdrafts? Updrafts. Yes, updrafts. So you're going to have updrafts over the land. All right. Now, in comparison, the water doesn't heat up as quickly so it's going to be cooler, which is going to cause, downdrafts. yes, downdrafts. <laughs> okay. Um, so 
this is gonna this updrafts and the downdrafts is basically gonna create a circular pattern. So the the air rises and then it comes this way. The air low like descends and then it goes inshore. And so you're down here, smiling, enjoying the beach, and you get a sea breeze. Basically, the wind is coming in from the, the water. Now, during the winter, I think it's the opposite, right? Here in Maine, is that correct? It tends to be the opposite because the, the land is very cold. Is that, is that what I understand? Okay. Yeah, the ocean stays warmer, whereas the, during the winter, the land is always pretty much cold during the winter. So you'll have the opposite effect. So like that. And that is true also for at night, even on like a summer day, at night you have, we'll just do land here, and then water. So again, the at night, I'll do the noon, or in the winter. Um, remember, the temperature of the land cools down faster. It changes temperature faster, so it cools down pretty quickly, but the water's temperature stays the same roughly. It cools down a little bit, but it stays more stable. So then you have cooler land and warmer water in comparison to each other, okay? And that causes basically the opposite effect. We have rising air that goes this way, and it creates a circular pattern with descending air on the land, and that creates a land breeze sending like air out that way. So at night or in the wintertime, you're going to see this kind of circular pattern. And you can think of it like when you're at the beach on like a hot, warm day, you get a sea breeze, right? You get a breeze off, off the water coming towards you. So you can remember it that way on a, on a warm day, at least in Florida. <laughs> um, any questions on that? OK. Um, what are some factors that can create turbulence? So the very end of the video was talking about this. Yes. Yeah, like at a low altitude, like on the surface. There's a bunch of different answers, so you could just throw, throw you can throw a guess out. Updrafts, yep, yep. Y yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so like what kind of things, yeah, what kind of terrain do you think would cause, yeah. Rocky terrain. Rocky terrain, mountains, trees, buildings. Unfortunate turtles. Unfortunate turtles, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sure, yes, 100%. I'll, 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 I'll agree with that. Um, okay, so like, let's think about this. What, why would this kind of turbulence be important for us to be aware of, like buildings or trees or those kind of things? Why? You don't want to hit the buildings. <laughs> you don't want to hit the buildings. Right. Yep, this is, this is important for takeoff and landing. Did you have something you wanted to say? Okay. Because, like, when are you close, when are you flying close to buildings? Right, taking off and landing. Otherwise, you're, like, way far away, you're up high, you're flying around. But that's the main time when you're really close to buildings and trees. And mountains, I mean, you could be flying close to a mountain at a high altitude. So you have to be aware of that, which I think one of the... Uh, We'll, we'll get into, I think, at a later time. But um, so those things are important. Those, the terrain things that could cause turbulence are important. And the updrafts and downdrafts, um, as you guys said, are also important because if you're on a hot day, if you're flying over, sometimes this has happened to me like only about a million times. But um, if you're flying, I'm like knock this thing over. Um, 
let's say you're coming into land on that very awkward shaped runway, and you got like trees. And then a lot of times there'll be like a, a flat kind of area field here, which will allow you to, to come in and have like a flat area that doesn't have any trees before you land. But as we were talking about, this is kind of like more barren, like plowed, flat ground with not much vegetation. And these are trees. So are we going to have, let's say it's a hot day, are we going to have uh, updrafts or downdrafts on this area? Updrafts. Yep. yep. What about on the trees area? Yep. Downdrafts. So you have updrafts on the more barren area, downdrafts on the trees area. This is like super common setup for most for a lot of uh, places where you'll go into land. So as you're coming in here, um, you'll get you'll you'll get like this turbulence where you'll be like up and down and up and down, and so you just have to be able to like pr prepare, prepare, plan, and think ahead basically for that. So um, yeah. Any questions on any of that? No? OK, we're going to end a little bit early tonight, because um, the next part goes into the next video. And we don't have time to get into that. So cool. Thank you guys for coming out. And it's just nice in the back and all that fun stuff.